How many of you have been here before? Please raise the hand. Okay, so I can at least... Okay, so the main part of you have never been here before. So my presentation has, let's say, the meaning to introduce you to our activities before starting to show you what we are doing here inside the National uh, Laboratories of Rascati, I want to tell you some words about this region. So you might know, or maybe not because you are too young, that Frascati is a famous region for wines. And uh, the city of Frascati, I hope you will have the possibility to visit it during this, uh, this period of staying here, at least guys who are coming from outside. And uh, well, so you can enjoy the nice atmosphere of uh, Frascati town, but it's as well famous for science because many of you might not know that Frascati, many Italians do not know actually, that Frascati is the highest density of a scientific institute in Europe. So part of our institute, which is uh, doing particle and nuclear physics, there are here other institutes like, uh, uh, well, one representing the European Space Agency, which is 100 meters near us. They do studies of the universe. Then there is ENEA, which is an institute which is studying non-conventional sources of energy and many other, many other interesting things. And then we have an observa astronomic observatory and material science nearby. So you are here in a region which is very highly uh, dense for what concerns the science uh, activities. Another thing which I want to tell you is that I hope that uh, you will use this opportunity not only to learn about physics and uh, we tried to organize a program which gives you an overview not only on particle and nuclear physics but on different sectors as well like the astrophysics, the dark matter and dark energy and our instruments like detectors and new accelerator techniques. So tomorrow you will have an overview of what might be looking an accelerator tomorrow. Uh, you, we will have organized a visit inside our infrastructure so you can see what I will show you shortly that we have here an accelerator and some other facilities. But we will try to give you an overview of how we work in our laboratories. We will have uh, four experiments. Each one of you will uh, do two of these experiments. We will divide the groups in two so you can go to see how electronics is working or you can go and check some of the quantum mechanics uh, mysteries, how the Planck, uh, how the Planck constant is it's derived. Or you can go and check the uh, work of the synchrotron radiation laboratories or how the gravitational waves are going to be measured. So you will have the opportunity to do these experiments and I hope that in the evenings or in the breaks you might exchange among you information and tell each other what you have done during these experiments. So a part of scientific goal, I hope you will succeed to become friends among you and to build solid friendship which might last and uh, propagate in your future and might become the basis for future collaboration, scientific or not. So having said this, I'd like to show you some, some of our uh, past, so how, who we are. Me personally, I am uh, an experimentalist. I'm leading a group of about 20 scientists who are doing experiments both, in, both inside the laboratories here on the Daphne Accelerator. We do studies of, I will show you, of some uh, atoms which do not exist in nature, exotic atoms. But as well, and I will tell you more about this Friday, we are doing experiments in the underground laboratories of Gran Sasso as well. So there are many different types of physics which is still uh, very much pushed. You will have a lecture on this by Anthony Palladino in, uh, by, I think, tomorrow to see what, uh, what's the mysteries when we look at the biggest universe. So uh, our institute is mainly devoted to do activities in what concerns the research in particle, nuclear physics and astroparticle physics, trying to disentangle and to answer to questions which are coming from long time ago. So how the nature works and what we are made of, we and all the things which are surrounding us. And uh, we are working not only, let's say, with our 
uh, colleagues here, namely we are around 300 among researchers, technicians and engineers, but we work in international collaborations as well. So half of our activities of the researcher working here, half are devoted to activities which are undergoing inside the laboratories, like related with the accelerator we have here, while half are working in experiments like those, for example, at CERN. And we have a long tradition, actually our activities uh, are rooted in a group of so-called Ragazzi di Via Panisperna, so which, which was uh, undergoing in the 20s, 30s, a group of very strong and very motivated young physicists led by Enrico Fermi. So Enrico Fermi was probably hopefully not, but probably yes, the last physicist who was a wonderful top-class theoretician and a top-class experimental physicist. He left Italy in the 30s when situation started to become uh, uh, difficult for the uh, uh, laws against the Hebrews. His wife was uh, Jewish, so he was uh, emigrating in the United States, where in 42 he built the very first experimental facilities, the nuclear power reactor uh, at Chicago. So, well, so these are the group of the guys who were in that years, in the late 20s, early 30s, put the basis of what now became the Italian uh, science in, uh, in the world, which was uh, starting with nuclear physics, uh, nuclear fission phenomena, which in the 30s were unknown. So were explored for the first time. They were checking the fact that an uh, uranium nucleus can be divided in two. That was a rather big surprise by that time but became afterward the root and the ground to build bad things like the nuclear weapons and to build uh, good things like uh, nuclear power reactors all to root the method for what concerns the age uh, determination using carbon-14. So after these uh, activities of this group, which was undergoing in Rome, in, uh, after the Second World War in the early 50s, uh, the four sections put together their join their efforts in order to become stronger. And uh, we know that very often happens that when you put together your efforts, you are becoming stronger and stronger. And that's how our institute, Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare, has started. So in early 50s, these four universities joined together to shape what became later on the National uh, Institute of Nuclear Physics. Our laboratories were born in late 50s. So it's already some years, we have celebrated 50 years of activities and we are famous in all the world, you will uh, have a hint shortly about uh, this, for building and designing new accelerator techniques. So in 57 we were born as uh, Laboratori Nazionali di Frascati and today, what we are today, actually it's uh, an institute which uh, counts together more than 2,000 persons spread in all these uh, sections in all over Italy. Uh, they are, main part are universities, so we are doing uh, research activities in the universities, but we have as well very uh, nice, uh, interesting facilities. So the most important and the biggest one for uh, fundamental physics in Italy, and one of the very few working actually in Europe and in the world is our laboratories, Laboratori Nazionali di Frascati, of which I will tell you more shortly. But there are some other facilities, one in Legnaro and one in Catania, so in north and south of Italy, where there are some accelerators as well to study mostly nuclear structure. So there is still a uh, lot to know about how an atom and its nucleus are composed and are working. And there is still a lot to know about which is the limit of an atom. So how big an atom can be? We have more or less, you know, from the Mendeleev table, we have around 100, a bit more than 100 types of atoms. But in nature, uh, the question of 
which is the heaviest atom in absolute, it's not yet received a uh, definite answer. So it's still a very interesting and hot topic to study, uh, if not for else, but there are many other reasons for which we are still studying this, but if not for else, because we do still don't know which might be the heaviest atom the nature can, can perform. Then there is a very uh, interesting laboratory, I will tell you more Friday, which is the biggest in the world underground laboratory. Underground in this case means, means under a mountain, so it's not really in, a mo in deep underground, but it stays under a mountain, so it, mountain, so it has on the top of it around 2,000 meter of rocks, a bit less, but anyway, which is uh, playing a role. And this is very peculiar because there are no accelerators there, so we are only studying what the biggest accelerator, namely the universe itself, is producing. And there is another facility which is not actually belonging to INFN, but which INFN is a partner, namely the so-called Virgo. Uh, oh, here it's not uh, seen. But it's European Gravity Observatory. AGS, which is a laboratory staying near, uh, near Pisa, which is studying gravitational wave based on interferometric concept. So it's two big lasers, three kilometers long, with some uh, degrees uh, angle between them, which are trying to see what's a uh, prediction of the Einstein uh, general relativity theory uh, gravitational waves, so the formation of space and time, which is produced, which we have it here as well in a minor scale. So it's still something which never has been directly observed. So in spite of the fact that it was previewed 100 years ago, it still uh, remained there to be observed. And this might produce a very interesting uh, new sector of astronomy, namely gravitational wave astronomy. And what we do here, in, in short, so if we want to make a synthesis of what we are doing here, it's actually to study the ultimate matter structure, so what we are made of, and which are the laws which stays at the basis of this structure of the universe. So we try to do this, and uh, a part of this we are searching for gravitational wave as well, with a gravitational antenna much smaller than Virgo, using a different concept which uh, those who are going to do the experiment on gravitational waves will, uh, will see more and will more, more or less touch with their hands. And uh, we are as well having a rather strong, even if small, theoretical division, which is trying to put all together and to create a framework and a theory, or to contribute to this, to understand these constituents, the last constituents, assuming that this uh, might be the case, that there is a last layer of reality. So trying to put everything in a framework of a theoretical model. In order to do this, of course, we need some tools, and we have built a lot of tools. These tools are starting to, from particle accelerators to uh, detector, particle detectors. You will have this afternoon from my colleague uh, Johannes Meskal, coming from Vienna, a lecture on particle detectors. Tomorrow, you will have a, uh, one for uh, accel new accelerator techniques, just to show you that in order to dream high, so to fly high in this sector, you need uh, in parallel to fly high in this sector too. Otherwise, it's impossible to see deeper and farther. So using only mathematical tools which are fundamental, you don't arrive, however, too far. You need to have clever instruments and clever materials. By the way, with these clever instruments and clever materials, you can not only do physics and research in this sector, but you can help a lot, and this is a sector which is growing very fast, do important steps for what concern other sectors. Material science and in this, this content, the biological science too. So the biomedical application, the use of our instruments to do research in biomedical application is becoming more and more and more important. So important that in different countries, facilities 
fully dedicated to these studies, like the XFEL, maybe tomorrow you will hear something. So generating particles and beams, which are dedicated completely to study, for example, the protein structures. We still don't know many, many important details about the proteins. We know that their composite plays a fundamental role. But what came out later is that not only their, uh, what's inside, but their geometry, their 3D folding plays a fundamental role. And this, this 3D folding, so their structure, it's yet not completely known. And uh, the physics instruments, can play a major role to understand how they are done. Of course, that in order to analyze the huge amount of data which we are taking, not only in experiments which we are dealing here, which uh, already ask for a huge quantity of computing uh, facilities, but since we are collaborating heavily in experiments at CERN, we need to build, uh, in collaboration with many other crown countries, clouds of computers. In our case, these computers are having a name which is called GRID, which are used deeply to analyze things which are the Higgs boson, for example. And you will have tomorrow a lecture, a very nice lecture of one of the most important uh, theoretical physicist in Europe, Gino Isidori. So tomorrow he'll give you an overview of the theoretical framework of what happens today in the physics, in particle physics. What I want to tell you that in order to arrive and to, uh, to uh, pin down, for example, the, the Higgs boson, you need computers which are able to uh, deal with a huge amount of data. So we contribute to this one too. With these instruments, so with our accelerator and particle detectors, we were able to explore actually two sides of, uh, of uh, the universe, of the world. We are mostly specialized in going smaller and more smaller scales. So we are exploring actually the micro universe, what stays inside an atom. But when we were looking what stays inside an atom with the accelerator, we have discovered many, many other particles which are not contained in an atom, but which are coming, produced either in the universe, so they are coming from the cosmic rays, or they are directly produced in the interaction of the particles in the accelerator. So there are many particles which are living very shortly. Afterwards, they decay in normal particles, those that uh, we, we have, for example, forever, like electrons and uh, protons. But uh, initially, they start with another type of identity. So there, are, there is an old zoo of particles, which we have discovered by these instruments. Of course, that in physics, and our colleagues from European Space, Space Agency, which are uh, staying nearby us, are exploring the universe at different scales. So they are looking at galaxies, and they are looking at phenomena which are staying there. This is, again, physics. So what stays in the universe, dark matter, dark energy, black holes, and all these monsters, some, some of them are still waiting to be discovered. Even those that we seem to know, like galaxies, are actually hiding still surprises. One of the questions which were dealt with lately was how, how small can be a galaxy? So how many stars can be called a galaxy? And the smallest galaxy ever was discovered recently, a couple of months ago, and contains about 1,000 stars. So there are still a lot of uh, interesting things to be studied, which are being actually studied with, with these instruments. For what concerns the research in the particle world, uh, I want to show you in this sketch the progress which has been reached in the last more or less 100 years. And you will see this, this progress is actually amazing. Because 100 years, it's, uh, I'm not saying nothing, but well, for the individual life, it's all our lifespan. But for the history of uh, humankind, 
and of even of recent years, it's it's actually very short. So in early 900, 100 years ago, the atom was still considered by many as a unity which cannot be cut in smaller pieces. So was uh, what actually the root of the Greek word atomos, not divisible, was still uh, considered to be structureless. And uh, the first surprise came actually before the end of the 19th century, because by, by this time the electron was discovered. And that was rather a shock, because the electron was obviously, they could determine the mass. It was uh, ki kind of thousands, thousands times smaller than an atom. So being smaller, and since it was actually generated from the matter, should have been contained in the matter. So this was a shock because showed that some smaller things than atom could exist. And then immediately after, somebody, people, not only one, but people tried to make a model which uh, contained the electron. And the first model which was put forward was the Thomson model, which was a mistake, but physics it's mostly, now I will tell you mostly the successes, but 90% of our work, it's not a success. It's trial and failure. Trial and failure is not bad. It's, it, it teaches you. So don't be afraid of failures. It's much worse not to try than to try and to fail. So in this case, this model was trying simply to, to, to build an atom where the electrons were staying like in a pumpkin, like uh, the seeds in a pumpkin or like, let's say, uh, well, whatever. So they were fluctuating in a soup of uh, positive mass being small balls of, uh, uh, of negative charge. Immediately after, since Rutherford, this uh, guy coming from New Zealand, uh, from a rather poor family but very determined to, to do what he wanted to do and he wanted to do physics. So he was succeeding to do first experiments of scattering where he realized that uh, there should be something inside the atom, very heavy, very compact, where most of the mass is concentrated. And this is how immediately after the beginning of 900, the very first realistic um, atomic model, which you still learn in the school and it's, it's valid, namely the Rutherford model, where the nucleus stays in the center, surrounded by electrons, came up. And this is a very successful model for main part of our application. It has some uh, additional feature coming from the fact that in this scale, namely in particle scale, when you deal with such small entities, uh, shockingly, uh, the laws uh, of uh, normal mechanics, Galilean mechanics, are not valid anymore. So you need to put together um, knowledge coming from relativity and from quantum mechanics. So this atom comes what you meet in chemistry. And in chemistry, you meet these orbitals. So this is more or less the same atom, but where the quantum mechanics plays a role. Quantum mechanics says that you can't really say the exact position of a particle. What you can say is where is probable you can find it. And this is an orbital. Where, where is most probably to find the electron? And this is not, this is not a limit, limitation of, it's not because we are not able to see it better. It's because it's really like that. So quantum mechanics has still a lot to teach us. Afterwards, uh, when we were happy that uh, we again understood the world like a small nucleus and uh, surrounded by electrons, it came as a surprise the fact that the nucleus itself has a structure since the proton and the neutron were discovered. And I advise you, whenever you have some time, read history of physics, because from the history of these discoveries, one can le really learn something, not only history. You can learn something of how to approach things, because you will see that it was really a debate of how this nucleus is built to compensate the charge of the electron. And again, was a failure success story, which in the end brought to proton and neutron as constitu constituents of the nucleus. Later on, it was another step, revolutionary step. Namely, it was uh, found that in turn, not even the proton and the neutrons are 
what could be called elementary particles. So now we unveiled a new layer of reality, which is the so-called quarks. So we see now that here it's, it's a game. Whenever we have stronger instruments, we are able to unveil a new layer. Of course, that now the question and the debate shifted here. And unfortunately, I can't uh, do another arrow here. And we don't know whether the quark themselves might be composite of something else, or instead, somehow, they are what, what it's called elementary particles. And here, the opinions, you might, you might learn something more, I hope, tomorrow from uh, Gino Isidori, are divided. There is a big part of community which believes that quarks are manifestations of the strings. So here comes the string theory. So we somehow approach, are approaching the last layer where you cannot cut in smaller pieces. There is a smaller community, but in physics, smaller means nothing. They might still be right. Which believes that in the end, here, something else might be unveiled if you would only have bigger accelerator. Bigger doesn't mean that now I need to build an accelerator surrounding the equator. So it's not that we need to go from here, from, from here to the moon. It means cleverer. And tomorrow, Massimo Ferrario will try to explain you which are our ideas or being cleverer. Uh, this this uh, goes to the dream of making an LHC accelerator, so-called tabletop. So not so big of 27 kilometers, but of 10 meters. So in order to do this, however, you need to make a jump, jump to new technology. So doing this, what we have arrived yet at the conclusion is that the world is done. When you ask, how is the world made of? The answer is, the world is made of atoms and other particles. However, in the end of the end, composed of quarks, surrounded by electrons, and some other particles were meanwhile discovered, like the neutrinos or brothers of uh, electrons, which are heavier. In the end, if we organize what we have discovered in this model, which, is, uh, which has received the name of standard model, we are arrived to this table, the so-called standard model of particle physics. In this model, a last part was missing, the Higgs boson, the Higgs boson, it's the one which has been discovered uh, two years ago, confirmed last year at CERN by the biggest experiments. And uh, what's interesting to know here, that the Higgs, Higgs boson, it's not just another particle, but from many point of view, is the particle, because it's the manifestation of what is a mechanism which is supposed to give mass to all the particles. So if you want, I will make a very short comparison. Uh, forgive me for being uh, going into a very low key, so it's a comparison which holds up to some, some point. If you imagine the Higgs mechanism, it's imagine something like a field. So imagine that you put some honey here. I take some jars of honey and I put the honey on the floor. So this is the equivalent of the Higgs field. And the particles are supposed to acquire their mass like a kind of uh, uh, spheres of plastic which are rotating in this honey and they get some honey on them and they become heavy. Take with the limitation of the comparison. So this is what people were thinking as being the Higgs mechanism. How can I know that this is true? How can I know that it exists such a field? So if I want to know that the honey is there, the only thing I can do is to have, at some point, a sphere of pure honey. This is the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is the equivalent of a sphere of only honey. So that's why it's important, because it's a manifestation of a mechanism which is supposed to generate the mass of all other particles. So uh, that's why it was uh, searched for, and it's still the search, the hunt is not yet over, because, uh, well, we still need to characterize it. We have seen it, but we, we've seen him from far away. We need to see his features, and we need to see how many they are, because in the standard model, we need only one. If at some point people do see two Higgs boson, 
or at least two particles which look like the Higgs boson, this would be extremely interesting because that means that the standard model, it's, it's overpassed by a model in which it is a limitation. And we need another model. We do need another model, if not for else, for this reason. Because the gravity, it's not contained in the standard model. There is nothing in the standard model to justify the gravitation. Now this is not a small problem, this is a huge problem. Because the universe, it's the, the, the dynamics of the universe, it's gravity. The galaxies, our Earth around the sun, everything is gravity. Why the gravity is not there? Not because at some point physicists became lazy, but because when I mean gravity is not in the standard model, why, what I actually mean, that if you want to describe it with a mathematical language, uh, for those who have ever heard of Lagrangian, who wants to describe mathematically in the same language, you put equivalent of the same mathematics for gravity, you calculate, 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 eh? long and tedious calculation, and you arrive at infinity. And Einstein was the first to start this calculation. It remained infinity, it's still infinity. Those, however, who claimed I succeeded to get rid of the infinity, and actually they did, did it with surprise and within another model. It's, for example, in the string theory, but it's not the only one. And the price they pay to make the gravity finite and to play a role in the universe, it's to allow the universe to have extra dimensions. So when you, when you allow the universe to have 10 or 11 dimensions, out of which n minus 3 that we live in are so-called compactified, the gravity turns to be, to be uh, e equivalent with other forces. But this is still, let's say, for the moment, not science fiction, but still. So this is what we are working on. So this framework of standard model, beyond standard model, is what we are doing in different ways. CERN is doing this as well. So this is what we are working at. And we are working at in many, uh, well, putting many efforts. Our efforts, it's, it's put here from uh, uh, here is our structure. So we are these persons. We are not infinitely many, around 360 persons, out of which you see that uh, we are researchers, around 100 physicists. But we are working with a lot of so-called external users. An external user means either a PhD student or a postdoc or a research coming from abroad to work with us and to join us in our efforts to study the things I showed you before. This is a uh, view of our lab. So here you see our main infrastructure. This is the Daphne accelerator. Here are the other accelerator because we have a complex. So Daphne is only the last step of uh, our facilities. We have this spark and flame facilities you will hear tomorrow from Massimo, which is our trial to go beyond accelerator techniques we have here. And now I want to show you some, uh, some, something about our history. So in the 50s, when we started to work, even before the roofs were built, so in that year was uh, snowing, and people in the 50s were installing this first electrosynchrotron accelerator. It was a hard life, but sometimes hard when you are young especially. It's nice because you remember that year as like being very challenging. And they did remember that year as being very challenging, under the snow installing accelerator. Afterwards, um, so that accelerator had only a beam which was colliding on some external target. And people already from the 20s, 30s, knew how to do accelerator where a beam, only one beam, it's coming out, it's interacting with a target, and then you might measure the products of those interactions with various detectors. However, this technique was at some point approaching a limitation. Limitation was approached due to many reasons. Uh, out of them, uh, four are quoted here. Like, for example, the last one, the target, it's complex. Of course, if you put a piece of metal here, and if you want only to study the interaction of protons, dong, of protons with protons, 
you, you are biased by a series of other interactions of protons with electrons or with neutrons. So there are a series of limitations which were starting to be, to be heavy. So in that moment, in the 50s, 60s, uh, for the first time in the history, a new accelerator proposal was born in Frascati. This was the idea of this brilliant guy coming from Austria, Bruno Tuschek. This aula is dedicated to him. Here you can see his, uh, his image. Uh, Bruno Tuschek, who, has not only, uh, who was not only a brilliant physicist, but was in the same time a very peculiar person. Because in the Second World War, he was Austrian, but was uh, Jewish. So he, he was put in the prison by, uh, by the Germans. So he was arriving at 40 kilos. He was almost dying for hunger. And uh, even in prison, he was still, he kept his mind busy. He survived thinking about accelerators. And when he, when, the war, when he was out from the prison, he came and spent the last 20 years of his life in Frascati, leading a group of young physicists who had this idea to put collisions of particles. So this idea looks rather simple. Whomever of us might be tempted to say, me too, I would have thought about this. The problem is not the idea. The idea is brilliant and it's clever. The problem is how to realize it. Because it, it works like this. How small is a particle? Nothing. So to make to collide two particles, it's like me and one of you being in the opposite sides of this room, we have one ball which is one millimeter in diameter, and you say, okay, jump, jump, let's collide it. It's extremely difficult to collide one particle. Of course, the idea is to collide billions of particles. So you put billions together against billions together, then you might have a chance to collide some of them. But keeping billions of electrons together, it's difficult. Because why? They are electrically charged, so they hit each other. So they don't want to stay together. And keeping them together, it's a challenge. So the main challenge is keeping together billions of particles in a very small space and making them collide. So uh, this idea of collision of particles, which was born for the first time ever here in Frascati, was, uh, this is more or less a pictorial view of what happens when particle and antiparticle collide. There is annihilation in our case. And in function of the energy, uh, bigger and bigger is the energy, you can produce a lot of particles in the final state. And that's what uh, a col collider is doing. So you put a lot of energy, you use the equivalence of mass and energy, and you materialize different particles in the final state. It's more or less like LHC it's working. In that case, it's not particle-antiparticle, but it's two beams of protons, but this doesn't, uh, well, doesn't really play a role. And they have built uh, the very first, uh, you might see it, it's in our open air, well, today is not maybe the best day, but when you will do the visit uh, Thursday, you will see it. It's still in our museum. It's the very first machine which was called ADA, Anello di Accumulazione, which was built in the late uh, 50s, early 60s, which was not built to do physics, but to prove the concept that they really succeed to make collision of beams of particles and antiparticles. So this machine did not do physics, did history of physics, which is even more important. Immediately they showed that this method, it's a valid method. They were given money to build in the 70s the first accelerator in Frascati, which was called Adone, which was doing a lot of interesting physics, digging into the mysteries of the standard model. And uh, after a while, after 20 years, in the 90s, more or less whatever we could know using this accelerator was known, so we moved farther. We moved farther, and please have a look of how this was clean inside and how this is messy inside. You will see with your eyes, Daphne Collider today. So it's not that we became more stupid, so we are not able to build a clean accelerator. It's because the accelerator we have today, it's much more ambitious. So it, it delivers hundreds times more events per second than the previous one. So it's much more challenging. 
uh, it has a number of more than 200 magnets packed together in a circumference of about 100 meters. So this is Daphne, it's the accelerator which works today. But I want to tell you that this method of collisions Soon after being born in Frascati, I'm not claiming that if it wouldn't have been born here, nobody would have invented it. Probably, yes, I'm sure it would. But it's a matter of fact that it was born here. Then was used, and it's used in many, many other parts of the world, in many accelerators, in Japan, in the United States, and at CERN. And uh, in our case, what we have in Daphne, you will see with your eyes, it's a collision of electrons and positrons in one point where they deliver uh, interesting events and phenomena which are studied to do many types of physics. Among these physics, what we are doing actually, so our physics for Daphne, it's collision of electrons and positrons with an energy which is fixed. In our case, it's not a high energy, it's much smaller, 10 times, 10,000 10, times smaller than CERN. But our aim is not to push in energy, it's to create this particle which is called phi, which decays immediately into other particles which are called kaons. They are our object of study. This particle which are called kaons do contain some quarks which are not inside the protons and the neutrons. They are called strange quarks, and we want to study how they behave. So we go to study this behavior of strange quarks because this is still somehow unknown. This is my experiment. What we do in our experiment is to study atoms produced with these counts insta instead of electrons, and these atoms, which are called exotic atoms, are having a behavior which is much different than the normal atoms. Because in the normal atoms, the electron goes around the nucleus only due to the electromagnetic interaction. In this case, on the top of electromagnetic interaction, there is the strong interaction between the quarks, between the nucleus and the cation. And we aim to study this strong interaction. Another experiment which is presently installed on the machine and which is called CLOE has many aims. They are most of them going to study how these counts are dying. So which are their decay modes? And they have a very interesting uh, uh, fallout. They see that the counts and the anti counts do decay differently. This came somehow as a surprise because time ago it was thought that the laws in the world of matter and antimatter should be the same. Actually, what we have seen is that this is not true. And this might have very important consequence of explaining where the antimatter, what happened actually with the antimatter in the universe after the Big Bang. Because it's believed that after Big Bang, matter and antimatter were produced in the same quantity. And since now in the universe there is no apparent trace of antimatter, something should have happened to it. And one of the hypotheses actually confirmed, but not yet uh, in the right quantity, is that they have different laws. And this is what Chloe is doing among many other things. This is the event track story of one event in Chloe, so this is what we see on our monitor. Okay. We are doing, this Massimo will tell you more tomorrow, so I'll jump about this. We try to accelerate to learn to do this tabletop accelerator. In order to do this, we don't want to use classical magnets. When I mean classical, I include superconducting magnets. We want to accelerate using lasers, using plasma. So using these new techniques, we hope to be able to push the particle like the wave in the ocean. So like uh, when you do surfing, you are pushed faster and faster. We hope to be able in a few centimeters to do what the present day accelerator is doing in meters or kilometers. We are still far to do this, but we are, we are approaching. With these techniques, however, they have an impact in society. One of the possible fallout is in the cancer, in the so-called mammography. So you might use these beams which we are creating uh, as side effect in our case to do a mammography which is much cleaner and might help the doctors to, to unveil small tumors wherever there are ambiguities. 
For what concerns the gravity, what we are doing is trying to determine whenever there is an explosion of a huge objects, the waves which are propagating in the space-time, like uh, similarly with the waves, electromagnetic waves, which are uh, listened by your phones, we try to do this with an antenna which gets the gravitational waves. And the gravitational waves of moving an object, an antenna, makes it vibrating. Don't, now, don't be scared, you won't suffer this effect, this is an exaggeration. So they are squeezing, they are making, oscillating an antenna whenever an object, for example, it's exploding, a supernova or a rotation of the two neutron stars. The point is that this vibration, infinitely small, it's billion part of the dimension of one billionth of a dimension of an atom. So in order to determine this oscillation, which are nothing, you need to do refined techniques of mechanics, cryogeny, and all that kind of things. We didn't yet see a gravitational wave, but this is, uh, well, does not depend on us. Depends on how many supernova are exploding around you. And uh, there are not so many. They should be rather near, not too near, otherwise uh, we wouldn't be here to tell the story. And we are participating as well at these experiments done at CERN in this underground, 100 meters deep underground LHC collider at these four experiments which are haunting different things. You will hear a lecture after me about the Alice. So see what Alice is doing. This is very interesting. These are the two experiments which has seen the Higgs boson. Now they are haunting, they are characterizing it starting from next year because LHC now it's stopped to be improved. While this one, it's still searching from matter, antimatter differences. This is what Higgs has been seen. This is what I told you. Uh, this is the Nobel Prize assigned immediately after the discovery to the two theoreticians, the Belgian one and the, uh, the uh, Peter Higgs, the famous Peter Higgs, who got the Nobel Prize uh, last year. Not, uh, well, the assignment was not completely smooth because uh, the experimentalist wanted to play a role, but it would have been difficult because there are thousands of persons involved, so whom to be assigned the Nobel Prize. And uh, we are still working. There are still plenty of things to be learned. The gravity in first. What is this mysterious gravity? This is the last of Einstein. So the last uh, blackboard of Einstein where he was still, still thinking about this. We are still thinking about this, trying to measure this. And mysteries like dark matter and dark energy, which will be told you by Anthony Palladino. So we are still fighting to understand when you look at the bigger universe, what it is made of in the energy budget. So since he will tell you more about this, I'm not going to insist. However, if you have questions, you might uh, ask whomever of us. And I close this with this um, um, citation of Einstein. I choose here a picture of Einstein when he was uh, young. Actually, I guess he was younger than you. And, uh, well, he was saying that there are two ways to live. You can live as nothing is a miracle, or you can live as is everything is a miracle. Try not to become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. And this is what I wish to you in this world which is becoming more and more complicated, which is posing lots of problems. Don't get discouraged. The future, not only yours, but of Europe too, it's in your hands. So try to, to become man of value and to give to Europe a bigger value than our generation maybe succeeded to give. So don't get discouraged even if life is difficult and do whatever you feel to do. I hope you will enjoy this stage, this masterclass. Uh, please, well, if you have questions, ask me or my colleagues. Don't be shy and, uh, well, Last thing, remember about the water, don't drink water from the tap. Uh, we don't want to check how efficient are the hospitals. And uh, enjoy your staying here. Try to talk among you, uh, make friendships, because friendship is very valuable in nowadays. And well, now we have a coffee break, after which you will directly start with the first lecture about the mysteries of this Alice physics at CERN. So thank you for being here, enjoy it and uh, don't uh, be shy if you have questions. Thank you very much.